we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, we have a quorum, barely. Um, let me ask Senator Tippins if he would come forward on Senate Bill 231. I know he's got a another engagement he has to go to, and want to make sure we address this bill directly and quickly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, I bring to you this morning Senate Bill 231. This is a very simple bill. It uh, deals with Code Section 42-8-60, which uh, deals with the issue of granting probation prior to adjudication of guilt and uh, first offender status. There is currently a list of crimes uh, that are precluded from the, the one who is uh, guilty of these crimes getting first offender status. This extends that uh, list to law enforcement officers uh, or those who have committed uh, assaults against law, uh, law enforcement officers, uh, aggravated assault, aggravated battery, or obstruction of law enforcement officer that results in serious physical harm or injury to that officer um, in their line of duty. This uh, was brought to me and I was asked to bring this on behalf of uh, the, the law enforcement officers in the state of Georgia. When it was originally brought, the suggested language was uh, much more uh, expansive than this. They included simple battery, uh, battery and simple assault and I took those out. I think uh, the last thing we want to do is maybe have a teenager that's a little bit rowdy on a traffic stop or an arrest where they really have no intent to harm an officer. Um, but I think uh, the provisions that are left in this bill, would it would be very clear that uh, those who would uh, commit aggravated assault or aggravated battery against a police officer had an intent to seriously harm that officer and they we don't feel like they should be extended the right of first offender status. And that's it in a nutshell and uh, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Questions for the author, Mr. Franklin. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. I, thank you for bringing the bill. Uh, I've got no objection to uh, extending uh, offenses uh, where you're where you can't have first offender status but a, a concern of mine is where we create a special class of victim where we say that this victim is a better class of victim than a mere mundane where say a loved one of yours is uh, uh, is is a victim of aggravated assault uh, uh, or or a loved one of one of your neighbors uh, why should that crime be treated less when it comes to first offender status uh, because that person's loved one uh, is not in a special class and that's that's the uh, a concern I have about the bill is that we're creating a special class of victim rather than treating all victims of these heinous crimes equally Representative Franklin, uh, I don't disagree with your premise on it. I, th I think this is crafted because in the statistic I heard just in the last day or two after the police officer was killed in mm -hmm. Athens, I think serious injuries against law enforcement officers are up 300%. I think that was the number that I heard over what they have been in the past. And I think you see an increasing level of violence ag against a specific class, if you will. I think police officers... Uh, in and of it themselves because of the nature of their work they are subjected to this more so and I, I think we all realize that if you're a police officer you may get in a scuffle every now and again but I think this bill goes to the heart of intent do they set out to harm uh, a law enforcement officer and I think this bill as it is um, extends an extra level of protection to those officers who have a higher probability of in encountering these kind of violent acts than maybe the population as a whole. And I, so I, I think that would be the reasoning behind it. Right, well, I, like I said, I, I fully understand what you're trying to do, but I, I would prefer to, to uh, afford these same protections to all Georgia citizens. Um, Thank you. That would be within the discretion of this committee if they want to change the bill. Uh, you know, it, it, 
it's not an unreasonable question, but the bottom line is on that particular issue is that do we, you know, is there a special set aside, for lack of a better term, given the fact that these are public safety officers um, who are the dividing line between, um, between order and chaos? Um, and given uh, the level of violence that we've seen really over in the last year, of course, the, the trooper who went down um, and was killed in the line of duty, uh, then the favors matter. And now, of course, the recent tragedy in Athens. Um, you know, victims of crime, that's, that's, that, you know, uh, that's a separate issue, not an unreasonable line of thinking in, in my personal and perhaps isolated opinion. But we are talking about uh, a public policy statement based upon a rational interest in the state, making sure that, um, that we do give, frankly, some heightened um, uh, sensitivity and uh, heightened um, uh, penalties for those against public safety officers because the state has a rational interest in making sure those public safety officers um, are on the job and, and doing their duty. My personal preference would be that the bill not be amended because I think it would open a lot more discussion uh, from prosecutors and uh, judges as to, as to their discretion uh, in a particular instance. And, and I, but I really believe this ought to be a statement to public law enforcement officers that we stand behind them and we want, we want to afford them a protection that's above and beyond uh, what's normally extended because their risk level is above and beyond uh, the normal population. Well said, and I agree. Ms. Abdul Salam. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Tibbins, thank you. Um, I guess along the line of the previous question, um, my concern is that the public safety officers actually uh, understand a certain level of danger uh, and risk when they sign up for the job, whereas we have school teachers, uh, as one of the national news programs uh, did a study last week, that are facing violence in the classrooms, and they're not given a certain category uh, and I don't know if this bill covers juveniles uh, for this um, set aside uh, but should we uh, also include our teachers and educators in such a, uh, a category I believe most uh, students who are in school could be covered under juvenile justice laws and I think it is a separate uh, set of circumstances I served on the school board for 12 years and I can almost say without question that the students who harmed seriously teachers in the school, uh, they did not walk. They didn't get first offender status. I mean, I think, I think violent crimes in a school are dealt with a lot more harshly than probably they are in a general population. But the rise in the increase is such greater now. Uh, and the level of severity is, is much greater. So maybe that's something I, we need to look at. I don't debate you on that. Thank you. I see no further questions. Senator, thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to be heard on House uh, Senate Bill 231? Thank you so much for your time. Seeing none, what's the pleasure of the committee? Mr. Atwood. Mr. Chairman, I recommend we pass on uh, Senate Bill 231, LC352218S. Mr. Atwood moves due pass on Senate Bill 231, LC352218S, second by Mr. Ramsey. Uh, are there any amendments? Seeing none, any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the gentleman's motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Yes. The ayes have it, and the motion is adopted. Thank you, Senator. Thank you so much. Previously, this committee passed out House Bill 185, which was the Runaway Youth Safety Act. Is that, did I say that correctly, Mr. Weldon? Yes, sir. The, um, Senate Bill 94 was under consideration by um, the Crimes Against Children Narcotics and General Subcommittee a day or two ago. Um, as a result of that meeting, um, the author in conversation with me yesterday has indicated um, that it is his choice to not move that bill uh, this year. Um, that is as per a conversation with him yesterday. Um, I. It is my understanding that he has no objection to this minute of our taking Senate Bill 94 um, and using it as a vehicle for House Bill 185. 
um, to keep that measure, that very worthwhile measure, alive that Representative Weldon and this and this committee worked on so hard. And so with that, um, I know it's been a couple of weeks since, or more maybe, since we went ahead and considered that bill. What I'm going to ask Representative Weldon to do is to uh, give us the refresh our recollection and give us the elevator speech on 185 now Senate Bill 94 and then uh, perhaps we can get to a motion sooner rather than later but let's try to expedite that since we've already been through that piece of business here. Thank you Mr. Chairman and ladies and gentlemen of the committee. I certainly appreciate the opportunity to be here um, particularly today on this bill uh, and one other. Um, it's truly a privilege. Um, this bill creates uh, an exemption to the harboring a child uh, criminal code and the uh, contributing to the delinqu delinquency of a minor uh, criminal code. And what this does is also creates a registry for um, not-for-profit agencies that provide services to runaways or homeless children, and um, it provides them for a period of up to 72 hours <coughs> and or as soon as the children's parents can be contacted. And uh, uh, the, the reason we're bringing this bill is to eliminate uh, the concern of these private entities who are not licensed but will be, according to this law, they'll be registered with the state. They'll provide information to the Sheriff's Department and, it, and the Sheriff's Department will provide uh, notice to all law enforcement agencies in the county um, of the the name, address, and who to contact, phone number for these uh, not-for-profit agencies that will be providing services to runaway children. Um, once a child comes in and accepts services from one of these not-for-profit agencies, they'll, um, they'll, have, they'll be required to contact the uh, department within 24 hours in the event there's abuse or uh, if there's abuse of any type uh, determined uh, or suspected, and um, if they if there's no abuse suspected, um, within 72 hours they have to contact the department. If the parents haven't been contacted and they haven't been able to put the child back with the proper guardian uh, of the child. Questions for the author, Mr. Sessler. Hey, Mr. Chairman, um, just wanted to highlight a couple things and just confirm for the committee, I mean, perhaps as a refresher, um, isn't it true this, this bill um, requires the entity to contact parents as soon as possible and ha has a duty to do that? It's not just 72 hours, it's, it's an immediate uh, re responsibility? Yes, sir. They have to, as soon as possible, contact the children's parents, um, uh, but not, it, it can't go later than 72 hours. If it gets to 72 hours, they have to contact. The department. Okay. Isn't it true that the 72 hour maximum is a bright line that under no circumstances can they retain the child without the, the following the due process? Correct. Okay. And lastly, isn't it true that these, these facilities, um, um, even though they're not licensed as group homes, as it were, they do have a licensed individual on their staff that is, is accountable as a nurse, as a psychologist, uh, social worker. So there is a licensed individual responsible here um, and that what this does is just registration so there's a list that's police can know for sure are you on the list or not on the list as an approved facility that's exactly right Mr. Sess. Ms. Neal thank you so confirming that persons that are not on the list will then be charged with the um, har not harboring, but the um yeah, harboring or delinquency of a minor. Okay. Contributing to yes, ma'am. <coughs> they certainly could be. See no further questions. Uh, Ms. Abrams. <laughs> Fire away. Um, in the state of the second, I'd like to make a, a motion to pass um, SB ninety four um, committee substitute LC twenty nine. Four eight zero four ERS. Motion by Mr. Susser for a uh, due pass for Senate Bill ninety four LC two nine four eight zero four ERS. Second by Ms. Abrams. Are there any amendments? Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the gentleman's motion signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? 
the ayes have and the motion is adopted. Thank you, Mr. Walden, for your hard work. Thank you very much, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen of the committee. Um, Senate Bill 214, Senator Hill from East Cobb, I know could not be here. Bob Keller from the Board of Pardons and Paroles um, is here. I know Senator Hill, actually Senator Hill donated that bill. Oh, by the way, for advocates of, um, of the Runaway S uh, Youth Safety Act, now Senate Bill 94, if you see Senator Bill Heath in the hall, uh, tell him thank you. You know, that matters too, so tell him thank you. Um, and uh, that's uh, very selfless of him, frankly. Senate Bill 214, much in the same vein, Senator Hill from East Cobb, um, sort of organ donation. This is bill donation. <laughs> donated Senate Bill 214 and another selfless act to the Board of Pardons and Paroles and our friends at Corrections on a bill, and with the committee's indulgence, I'm just going to ask uh, Mr. Keller from the, bo uh, the parole board to uh, give us uh, a brief synopsis of that, and then we'll march on from there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My okay. name is Bob Keller. I'm one of the five members of the board of, of pardons and parole, and we express uh, our deep appreciation to Senator Hill for giving us this bill. It started out as a bill involving wireless communicators or cell phones in the prison system after looking at it was not necessary and we approached him with a, a critical need that the Department of Corrections and Pardons and Parole had and he was gracious enough to allow us to have what is now Senate Bill 214. Uh, if you look at the Pardon and Parole as well as the Board of uh, the Department of Corrections, uh, certain records that we have are confidential and we cannot disclose them to anyone. But right now, 52% of the sentences that are, are given in our courts are what we call split sentences. They involve both incarceration and probation. And so what we have in, in our situation is a handoff. Once a person has successfully completed parole, we hand them off to probation. And unfortunately, uh, we found that we cannot share information uh, of that parolee with the probation department which results in duplication of services, which creates a problem uh, for public safety, and it also creates a problem for the uh, parolee slash probation. Uh, they sometimes have to go back and get services that they've already had. Uh, we work with the Attorney General's office, and unfortunately, we can't find a way to fix it without a statutory change. So that's what Senate Bill 214 does. If you notice on the first page, uh, looking at, at line uh, 19 through 22, basically what this says is that the Department of Corrections, uh, once they get this information, this information remains confidential, that they cannot give it out unless we have declassified it. So that is, a, if you notice, uh, 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 line 14 through 18 talks about what happens to corrections records. And once our supervision records go over to corrections, 18 through 22 just protects those records so that they are not disclosed outside of their agency. And then on the second page in section 2, lines 39 through 41 basically gives us the right to share our supervision records with, with probation. And so this is, this is a bill that everyone likes. It, it uh, does not do anything other than just make sure uh, that we can have a seamless transition between parole and probation, uh, and it will enhance public safety. It will also help the, uh, uh, the parolee as well as the probation. So we ask your favorable consideration, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Ms. Abdul-Salam. Just glancing through it real quickly, I want to make sure that this includes electronic records and all other forms. Every, every, every kind of record. I just didn't see it. So the word records contemplates electronic records as well and encompasses that, right? Uh, is there anyone, thank you, Mr. Keller. Is there anyone else like to be heard on Senate Bill 214? I see no further questions from the committee. Anyone else would like to be heard on 214? I'm presuming corrections is on board and all. Okay. Pleasure of the committee, Mr. Franklin. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to pass on Senate Bill 214. Move to pass Senate Bill 214. 
second by Ms. Abdul Salam. Is there any are there any amendments? Are there, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the gentleman's motion signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The ayes have and the motion is adopted. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Keller. You, Thank you very much. Let's go to Senate Bill 80. Senator McCoon, welcome. For members' reference, let me make sure that you have, there are various versions in your folder. And so before we have Senator McCoon speak to the underlying substance of the bill. Let me just make sure you have. Okay. You should have in your folders three different versions. You should have the underlying bill in blue. And then there are two substitutes in your folder. One substitute. which is LC294802S. And I want to make sure I'm getting this right as to what's what. Is, thank you. you I'm glad you're, glad you're here. I was about to ask you. Uh, that substitute, LC294802S, is a, is a potential committee substitute, which is the sub the entire substance of uh, Representative Chairman Neal's uh, House Bill 299, which this committee passed out. So, which is there anyone else anyone who doesn't have that on the committee? LC 294802S it should be in your file. Again, that is a substitute, a, a potential proposed committee substitute, which is essentially and is um, substantively Chairman Neal's House Bill 299. That we passed out. You should have another substitute, which is LC 294806S, which includes both Chairman Neal's legislation, House Bill 299, which we passed out, and House Bill 402, which is the expungement bill by Vice Chairman Hatfield, which this uh, committee uh, uh, passed out as well, though late in the session. Um, I offer both of those to you. Uh, my sense is that um, we're going to have a discussion here. Um, Senator McCoon understands that uh, members that may have certain uh, predisposed notions on the subject matter and which way to go, especially in consideration of where we are um, from a budgetary standpoint and in terms of, frankly, what the GBI can handle right now, what it's not prepared to handle fiscally. That being said, I wanted to make sure it was clear in the event that members of the committee are comfortable with passing a substitute that includes 402, the chair will be very comfortable in taking that motion as a all-inclusive committee substitute. That will end up being the pleasure of the committee. I just wanted to, I just wanted to make sure the committee was aware that that particular substitute exists. If the committee, um, if a motion should come on that, it will be accepted and, and there will be a vote. Is there anything about that that, that I, if I confuse everybody or is there half, is there an ounce of clarity to that? All right. Two th all right. Thank you. <laughs> I hear you loud and clear. <laughs> thank you. Um, with that, let me recognize Senator McCoon. Welcome, and thank you for bringing your legislation. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, members of the committee, for the opportunity to bring to you today Senate Bill 80. Um, I want to take a moment to explain 
the legislation. I think the committee members have some general familiarity with it. Then I want Senator McCoon, about. let me, I apologize for interrupting. We just got word that there's something wrong with that mic. Oh, okay. So if you could move to that mic, I'd sure appreciate it, just for purposes of proper broadcast and so forth. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee for the opportunity to bring you Senate Bill 80. Um, I want to take just a moment to explain the legislation and then go over some of the concerns that um, we had when we went through the committee process in the Senate. Um, the legislation would extend uh, Georgia law, which currently authorizes collection of uh, DNA samples from incarcerated felons for loading into the CODIS database. Um, and it would expand that authority uh, to any person arrested for a felony offense upon a determination by a magistrate or grand jury that probable cause exists for that arrest. After um, the conclusion of the uh, charge for which uh, one, one's DNA has been taken, there are a number of grounds uh, to have that profile expunged if the charge is acquitted if the charge uh, is dead docketed, if it's dismissed, um, or if the arrestee pleads to a misdemeanor charge. Uh, so that is in essence what the legislation does. Um, the three issues that I wanted to address were the constitutionality question, which I've heard a lot about, the uh, cost of implementation, and the effectiveness of expanding this authority to all felony arrestees. Uh, first on the constitutionality of this uh, this law, uh, this law or uh, statutes similar to it have been adopted in 24 different states, um, including uh, California. The law was challenged um, in a case, uh, United States versus Poole, uh, that was decided by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in September of last year. And I just want to read a portion of the court's ruling to you. Uh, the Court of Appeals affirmed a district court ruling upholding the arrestee pr uh, provision. And uh, the actual opinion stated, where a court has determined that there is probable cause to believe that the defendant committed a felony, the government's interest in definitively determining the defendant's identity outweighs the defendant's privacy interest in giving a DNA sample as a condition of pretrial release in cases in which the government's use of the DNA is limited to identification purposes and there is no indication the government intends to use the information for any other purpose. I would submit to you that there is, uh, there are few champions of the rights of criminal defendants greater than the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and they have certainly found uh, law similar to the uh, Senate Bill 80 uh, to meet a constitutional challenge. Uh, as far as the cost of the program is concerned, we did uh, request a fiscal note, and uh, the fiscal note uh, determined that the initial cost of the program would be uh, $3.8 million in the first year with a going forward cost of $3.1 million. That 3.8 million reflects some capital expenditures that would have to be made to ramp up capacity necessary to implement the program. Recognizing the very real budget constraints facing uh, the GBI, uh, Senate Bill 80 provides at lines 46 to 48 that the act would, be, would become effective only if funds are specifically appropriated for purposes of this act. Um, we certainly want to see this, this bill become law and then I certainly hope that that would trigger a very important debate on our budgetary priorities and uh, the importance of implementation of Senate Bill 80, which leads me to the question of effectiveness. And there's been a lot said about uh, whether or not uh, expanding these databases to uh, all felony arrests are effective, and I just want to share with you a little bit of information on that. Uh, the state of Virginia, which has adopted a law uh, that includes all felony arrestees, and they have found upon a review of the hits in their database that over 80% of the 6,000 matches made on their state's DNA database would have been missed if the state had limited its collections to only violent criminals. In fact, qualifying offenses for forgery actually matched to more crimes than did qualifying offenses for sex crimes or for murder, abduction, and kidnapping combined. In uh, in Virginia, a significant number of the crimes matched to nonviolent forgery and drug possession offenders were violent crimes, including a total of 79 rapes and murders, four assaults, a carjacking, and a robbery. 
Uh, California has had a similar experience. I've got further information on that. Um, in New Mexico, uh, since implementing a law similar to Senate Bill 80, the state of New Mexico has matched 146 arrestees to 176 unsolved crimes. Of the 146 matches to arrestees, more than half were matches to nonviolent arrestees. And the matches made to these 81 nonviolent arrestees accounted for nearly half of all matches to unsolved homicides and sex crimes made on the database, and 90% of matches to unsolved assault and battery cases. Finally, in Illinois, uh, in support of arrestee DNA testing legislation, the City of Chicago Police Department created a report cataloging 60 violent crimes, including 53 rapes and murders, that could have been prevented had DNA been taken from eight individuals for their first felony arrest. In fact, these individuals accounted for 21 felony arrests before they were finally identified as serial predators, and only seven of these arrests were for violent felonies. So I would submit to you that there is a wealth of data available in the 24 other states that have already implemented this legislation to support its effectiveness. And uh, for those reasons, uh, I would strongly urge the committee uh, to consider uh, uh, a due pass recommendation on Senate Bill 80 as passed. I'd also ask, and I know I spoke to the chairman about this yesterday, uh, if Ms. Joan Berry, uh, whose daughter the, the, the Senate Bill 80 is named for, might have the opportunity to speak to the committee as well. We'll ask uh, Ms. Berry to come forward if she'd like to right now. Ms. Berry, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank I'd, you for absolutely. allowing me to speak here today. Sure. Let me. Um, I, I know you've been through a lot, and um, we appreciate your dedication to the issue. Uh, your the floor is yours. Let me ask you if you could to confine your remarks to about five minutes or so, if you could. Sure. Absolutely. Thank you. First, let me say thank you for allowing me to speak here today. I am not a speaker. I'm just a parent that has lost her daughter to a violent crime. Jonna was murdered in December. 6, 2004, in the early morning hours, someone entered her apartment and he was looking to steal a set of keys. When he didn't find them, he went into her bedroom where she was sleeping and he stabbed her 17, over 17 times. Um, you know, let me say for one thing too, a lot of people think when someone is murdered that they put themselves in a situation that sometimes causes that. It doesn't matter if they did or not, they don't deserve to be murdered. But that's not the case in Jonna's case. Um, she was very ambitious. She graduated college in three and a half years with a double major. She was the youngest female to attend law school in Michigan. And uh, she decided she didn't like that, so she wanted to work with children. She had a great love for children. So that's when she came back back home. We live here in Lawrenceville and she moved to Knoxville and that's where she was murdered. Um, it took two and a half years to find the person that murdered her. There was DNA left at the scene. She fought very hard for her life. Excuse me. I'm sorry. I don't know why I do this. It's very emotional and hard for me. But if one life can could be saved, it would be worth it. They took over 400 <laughs> DNA samples in the state of in Tennessee before they found the person that murdered her. He had been in trouble before. Had his DNA been taken, it would only been a matter of probably a couple months at the most or weeks that arrest could have been made. <laughs> and we weren't we weren't aware, you know, we were just a happy family like most of you are, are not aware that our system is like this. I feel it's very important to give our law enforcement every tool that they need to work with to protect us. When Tennessee passed the law, it was the eighth state. Now there's 24 states that have passed this law. It, it, it's not an invasion of privacy. If you don't ever intend to be in trouble, then you know I don't think you have anything to worry about with your DNA being in the database. Also, it um, helps another, um, 
identify unknown remains. Um, just a few weeks ago, there was a, a case here in Georgia, a, a bank robbery that you might have read in the paper. It was solved. There was two arrests made from DNA. They had um, got the mask that they wore and, and, and got DNA from it. But I'm a member of the Surviving Parents Coalition, and I have met many parents that are in the same place that we are. And I don't do this for me or for my daughter, Donna. This is very hard for me, and I keep saying I won't do this anymore, but <laughs> I really feel that it's important that people know that our law is like you, and we should do everything we can to make it people in Georgia's safer place to live. Thank you for taking the time to join us this morning. We do appreciate it. Mr. Sessler, did you have something? Okay. Thank you. No, thank you for your strength. Let me ask, um, uh, were there any, uh, any uh, questions for uh, the sponsor before we get to witnesses from members of the committee? I think we've been here before. Um, it's just a function of how, how far we go. But were there any questions for the sponsor? Mr. Sessler? Sure, I assume so. I mean, yeah, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Well, we're. That's going to come down. Right. That's going to come down. I appreciate the question. That's going to come down to whatever motion is made. I just want to make sure that members of the committee understand what the options are. It's the underlying bill. It's the it's the two ninety nine substitute, as a standalone. And the second op and the third option is the uh, is uh, the two ninety nine plus House Bill four hundred two the expungement as a as a as a third option. So questions for the author, Mr. Sessler. Hey, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator McCoon, welcome to Non-Civil Judiciary. Thank you. Um, this is uh, um, w one of the pleasures in being in the legislature. From time to time, you get to come to the committee and and be part of the process. Um, this is a serious subject matter, though, and I, and I appreciate your attention to it, and I appreciate your, particularly your bringing the facts um, regarding what other states have con considered and done and so forth, and uh, the, the facts regarding um, you know, the hits that have apparently been gotten in other states. I would ask you, though, um, and Mr. Chairman, I've, I've got, a, got a series of questions for the gentleman. Um, the fingerprint as it exists today in law enforcement, when someone's arrested, um, isn't it true the fingerprint is used as, f first of all, as a way of, of identifying the, as part of the identification process of the suspect to book and, and catalog who the person is that was arrested um, so that if there's ever um, bond posted, they come back, the, the same person that comes back to court can be verified person that's actually incarcerated and put away for 10 years, 5 years, 1 year, 60 days, when they come back, that there, there's verification that the prints that were taken ap upon arrest match the person that's put away and so forth. Isn't that sort of, sort of part of the process of confirming identification of, of the suspect? Yes. Okay. Um, and I suppose the distinction I would draw with DNA, though, is that if you've got fingerprint information on a person, which is definitive and unique, um, isn't the real use, the desire to use DNA upon arrest, um, not for purposes of identification that the person that was arrested is the person that's put in prison, but that's really for the purpose of, of taking the DNA and, and, and using it as a means of investigating other unsolved crimes? I, I think that the use of the DNA is exactly as the use of the fingerprints. Uh, the fingerprints are also subject to being placed in a database and uh, search for hits. DNA is just simply more definitive in terms of being able to positively identify uh, the individual in question. So I, I understand what you're saying. I, I, don't, I don't see a distinction between the uh, fingerprinting at booking and taking the uh, DNA sample after a probable cause has been found to support the arrest. See, the distinction I would draw and I would ask you to consider um, is, you know, if, if we're taking fingerprints for people, 
and there's a there's there's a there's a need arguably to take a fingerprint to confirm that the person is is the person who they are at every step in the process. Um, you know, it's it's been it's been a longstanding practice to when that's collected for a lawful reason to scan that against a, a fingerprint database, for example. But th the desire to take a second means of identification for DNA, um, I, I would. In, a, in looking at that and, and drawing a parallel for that, I, I would ask you to, to consider, and, and we, we we addressed this in the subcommittee, but not before the full committee. Um, give you give you a case, a, 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 a sort of a fact set. I want to get get your opinion. If there were a let's let's take a kind of a lighthearted example. Let's imagine there's there's a little league baseball game, and um, you've been to some before. I have. I've got got young kids, and so, say that you've got an overzealous coach that gets out there on the first baseline and is arguing over a call and gets in an argument with the referee and the the, the coach is so zealous he picks up the, the, the fight ensues there's some shoving coach grabs a bat and cracks the referee across the head with a baseball bat flattens him puts a blood mark across his head that's under in, under georgia law that, that's an aggravated battery is it not <coughs> yes okay um because it's salt potentially deadly weapon he's committed a felony um and certainly law enforcement, because you've got witnesses all around, law enforcement come arrest him, book him for a felony, put him in, uh, put him in uh, custody. And I don't think anyone here would dispute that. The challenge is if local law enforcement decided upon that incident to launch officers to his house to search his home, and to launch officers from Cobb County across the border to Paulding County where his business, where his landscape business is, and search from top to bottom his landscape business. Um, as a result of that aggravated battery. If in searching his business in the next county over, his landscaping business, if you found cocaine stashed away in a, in a, in a corner of his office, would that cocaine um, that's found in his office that was launched as a result of a search from this, w would that be admissible in court? Well, I think the question would be, uh, ob obviously to obtain a search warrant, they would have to go to a judge and uh, the judge would have to sign a warrant the scope of the warrant would be at issue, um, you know. Uh, so I think there are a lot of questions. I, I think just as as Senate Bill 80 would do, there's a judicial review that has to take place before they could move forward with a search uh, of his home. And uh, I think the question of, of whether or not he could be charged for that would would be both fact dependent and dependent on the terms of the warrant. And once again, you know, when he's booked at the at the at the jail, there's um, there's no um, there's no indication of alcohol use. There's no indication of drug use that contributed to the execution of the crime. It's just an angry guy, and they, he's completely sober. Um, I would submit to you, and I share that as an example, and I know you're a practicing attorney, um, a magistrate would not issue a search warrant for the gentleman's business in the next county over because he got passionate and cracked a, cracked a referee with a baseball bat. And I think, I think you, you would recognize that. I, I certainly can't think of, of any reason why he would in, in that circumstance. And I share that as an example because I think it's a, it gets to first principles. What we've, what, what, what's in play is is that you can't take an underlying felony charge on someone and investigate that individual for a completely unrelated crime. The notion that you're going to search their business for drugs and have that as evidence be admissible for an underlying felony charge that's completely unrelated is well established in our court system as being not admissible. You can't search the business because he hit because he hit a he cracked a, a referee with a baseball bat. They're completely unrelated. And I would submit to you the concern with this DNA bill when you get back down to the, the core print, first principles is is that the fingerprint gives you the ability to identify an individual throughout the process. But the, the real purpose, although the stated purpose perhaps, is that DNA is just like a fingerprint. That the real purpose here is is when we've arrested somebody for a felony, the potential because they're in custody, the potential to take their their DNA and scan it against any number of other crimes nationally, is such a delicious proposition for us that that because they're in custody, their their, their liberty has been deprived. We want to take that DNA and just like investigating the person's business for an unrelated crime, we want to investigate him against in one to end crimes in other states just seems too good to pass up, but constitutionally has the same challenge as the circumstance I presented with the baseball field and the business. And with fingerprints, there's, there's, a, there's a need to, to identify the person. 
But the DNA is a very different proposition. The underlying purpose of this is to do exactly as I've described. I think it's on that point that I have profound constitutional problems with. And I, I would only respond to that by saying the Ninth Circuit, the Second Circuit, and the Third Circuit have found statutes substantially similar to the one before you constitutional. And uh, I think certainly there's a valid public policy debate to be had, but I think all of the circuit courts are making it clear that, that this is a constitutionally permissible uh, statute. Mr. Atwood. Let me see if I can build on this a little bit. Uh, you had an assault in Gwinnett County. A man picked up a baseball bat, hit the other person. Would that preclude the Brunswick Police Department, who had a similar assault from sending DNA, requesting D, uh, sending DNA up, or a fingerprint, let's say, up to the FBI Identification Center and doing a match to see if it's ever happened before or doing a match up uh, if this guy has ever been arrested before. Would it preclude that? I submit it wouldn't. You know, that's essentially the same thing we're talking about here as I see it. Uh, I don't believe that the, the way of using DNA, and maybe you can help us, is that they run it against any crime ever, vi ever violated in the United States. That specific analysis has to be requested or DNA submitted to see if there's a match similar to a match of fingerprints. Is that correct? I, I believe that is correct. I think the more you get into the, into the technical process, I would probably defer to the folks from the GBI that I think are here to speak to that issue, but but yes, that's my understanding. Okay. Mr. Chairman, if I could have sure. one more question. I'm, I'm uh, looking at the substitute, I'm looking at, at your bill, and I, uh, I, I, I like your bill. I like it very much. I congratulate you for bringing it. Um, my concern is can we afford it? I want this done now. And have you had, I, I know you mentioned you had a physical note. It's going to cost some money. Have you had discussions with uh, whether or not the money could be forthcoming, or is there uh, well, my, my thought process on that was um, after consulting with the GBI and understanding the, uh, the difficulties, at one time we had a, what I thought would, would be a funding mechanism that would work, and then you know we, we determined that was not uh, going to be practical. Uh, so what my hope is, and, and this was the, the process in Tennessee, the bill was adopted subject to a contingency clause as this bill has and then I believe in the next budget year or the, maybe the second budget year subsequent to that th the funds were appropriated but if we go ahead and adopt this bill and provide the legal authority to, to do this I, I am very prepared to have the debate about the central role public safety has as a purpose of our government and, uh, and why this should be fully funded in addition to the backlog the GBI is already facing because mm -hmm. of uh, a shortage of funds. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ms. Ramsey. <laughs> we talked about this a good bit in, in subcommittee, and, and I think the concern on privacy grounds, I am 100% confident it's constitutional, but, but I think there is concern about the ability to misuse DNA. and and. And <clears throat> when kind of fleshing this out in subcommittee, any, anybody that raised a constitutional concern could never cite one single example anywhere in the country where it's ever been misused in any way. Are you aware of any example where uh, there's been an unauthorized DNA? Because at the end of the day, the purpose to which we're putting DNA and the purpose to which we're putting fingerprints are to identify criminal suspects, prove criminal, uh, criminal offenses uh, were committed by a person, and just as we use fingerprints, they're used to, to, to be put across the, the, the database to see if there's a match somewhere else uh, on, on, a, on another unrelated criminal offense by that suspect. Are you aware of any instance anywhere in this country where DNA has ever been misused by a, a body, a law enforcement body, a state law enforcement body that collects DNA? I, I'm not aware of any such case. No, thank you. <laughs> Ms. Abdul Salam. Thank you. Um, I don't know if I can cite the case, but I'm a, I'm aware of allegations of misuse of DNA, allegations of planting DNA. I'm also aware of the the profiling issue, uh, and that's what I'm very concerned about. And my specific question, which may have to be answered by GBI, is the disposal of the destruction of the samples. Uh, on line uh, 34, 33, and 34, it talks about uh, destroying the samples, but it doesn't tell you how they'll be destroyed. 
Uh, it also talks about uh, making a written request when many of the uh, persons that may be accused um, simply are going to be uh, either uh, uh, un unable to afford legal counsel to do that and, and possibly, quite possibly, oftentimes illiterate and not able to do so themselves. I'm very concerned about that requirement. Uh, we have constituents now that are still trying to get um, uh, removal from first offender requests, and it's almost impossible to do. So I'm very concerned about the destruction and the removal of the samples if a person is supposed to have that sample destroyed. Uh, that is a concern that I really deeply have. Well, I would, I would defer uh, to the GBI on the question of the actual technical process of, of destroying the samples. Um, as to the question about expungement, that is something that we've had a, we had an extensive discussion about uh, as we went through the process in the Senate, and uh, we we uh, had a discussion about trying to uh, have a broader expungement reform to make expungement more readily accessible and available and easier for individuals to to maneuver through that process because of the well documented uh, issues with that. I, I would only add that we, we've discussed a lot about the fact that DNA will oftentimes uh, match and take violent criminals off the street. There have been a number of situations where it has exonerated wrongfully right. convicted individuals and certainly uh, that, that is another benefit to expanding the, uh, the universe of these DNA samples is that not only will wrongfully, uh, not only will violent criminals be taken off the streets, but uh, wrongfully convicted individuals uh, can be set free by the availability of this DNA evidence. After 20 and 30 years and a lot of money, very few. And so I'm just wondering whether that will will warrant taking DNA of everybody. Uh, I'm very concerned about that. I also uh, do not understand um, the burden of the the, I guess, accused being the person responsible for having the destruction of the samples when they're not the person to take the samples. Well, I think just as the burden is on uh, a criminal defendant uh, to have an arrest expunged, I mean, this is this burden is is part of the expungement process and perhaps something that should be explored further um, it, as part of a broader expungement reform. But yep. I think we're just tracking the, the process that's already in place. And, and what proof will there be that the samples were destroyed? I would defer to the GBI on that question. You said they were here. Yeah, I believe so. And line 33 says the GBI shall destroy all samples. Doesn't say return. Is that current law? No. It's new that's, law. It's, uh, proposed. Th that's the proposal under it. I, well, <laughs> I think we've just gotten a summary of GBI's position. It's not position. funny, y'all. Um, <laughs> it's really bill. not funny. It's very serious. Well, let me ask you this. I mean, I... You know, we're now making the presumption. I think GBI probably ought to go ahead and proactively say, I mean, to speak to the burden of the destruction requirement under lines 33 and 34 of the underlying bill. Mr. Pankhead, you probably ought to come forward. And Mr. McCoon, we're not tossing you out of there. It's just that we're trying to help the organic flow of the conversation here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. John Bankhead with the GBI. The issue we're facing at GBI budget-wise with respect to taking on a new program like this, even when funding is available or becomes available, is that we got these holes behind us. Right now, uh, the DNA section is funded by a large percentage from the federal government. And those grants on federal government grants, those grants are going to end next year. 
So we're going to have a big hole in our budget that has to be filled by the state if they want to continue the DNA program. You add a new program like this that costs three or four million dollars and don't fill that other hole, then we have major issues because we're going to lose staff uh, that, you know, handle the DNA database in the DNA program at the DVI. Okay. So that's the issue we're facing. We got these holes behind us that the state has to fill. Uh, and then we've got this issue with this new program that's going to cost more money. And so that's an issue for y'all to decide. But uh, it's just more than the cost of this particular program that, that we have to deal with. Okay. Let me, um, let me say this. Uh, I see some lights for follow-up questions while they're here. Are there, do, do members have any specific questions for the GBI while they're up front? Ms. Abdul-Salam. I'm still curious about the destroying all samples. I didn't get an answer. Can I, can I address yes, please. Okay. Um, Let's Chairman. see if we can get that microphone to work. It, it. All right. I don't know. <laughs> okay. George Heron, I'm the director of the GBI Crime Lab. Uh, the database samples are actually stored in the laboratory and maintained, and we do that because whenever we have a potential hit to, a, to an unsolved crime, we actually go back to that sample that is stored to verify that the, the, the initial analysis was done correctly. Then that analysis is used to inform the law enforcement agency, the relevant law enforcement agency and prosecuting offices, that we need a new sample from that offender in order to verify that that is in fact the person that it was collected from. So there's a very big checks and balances system in this process of using the DNA database. We're not just randomly going out and saying, here's a Here's a match to a sample. This is the guy that committed, or this is the person that committed the crime. Um, when a person asks uh, the expungement issue, when they, the samples would be expunged, we would actually either incinerate or remove all identifying information from that sample and then destroy it in a biohazard waste stream, which is, you know, whichever is the most appropriate from a safety standpoint. Um, all of the computer records would be expunged, so there would be no records remaining at the GBI, but we need to maintain the samples that we get that we have to have in the database so that we can do that verification process. So you don't destroy all samples? We, we, we do not destroy database samples. Casework samples, we do return those to the law enforcement agency that submitted them originally. So it's the, the, the DNA database samples are a little bit different than a normal casework sample from that standpoint. So you don't destroy all samples? We do not destroy all samples. No Thank you. I know there are a couple of questions uh, for y'all, but I know Mr. Ramsey had one. Okay. Just, just so I'm clear, uh, based on testimony when we were debating uh, Chairman Neal's bill, you are confident if, if we were to take that step in the ability to get a grant to fund the and the, the, we you're pretty confident we could this year have in effect uh, the the expansion to all felony arrests from a funding standpoint. Is that accurate? All felony probationers, right? Not Con convictions. I'm sorry, I yes. misspoke. I mean, uh, felony convictions. Yes, yeah. the, the the Neil bill. We could do we could do that. We could absorb that in the okay. laboratory with the current grant funding uh, scheme that we have right now. Right. Okay. Um, just to expand upon Mr. Bankhead's. Um, testimony about our funding, I've actually got a meeting with OPB immediately following this hearing uh, where we need approximately $2.7 million annually to, from state funding to fill all of the grant funded positions that the laboratory is currently using to maintain our operations. So, Mr. Atwood, did you have a question for the GBI? Uh, he already answered it. Okay. Yeah. Very well. Mr. Sessler, did you have a question for the GBI? I have one. Okay. Gentlemen, thank you. Thank, thank you, Senator McCoon, if you would return, I'm going to ask Mr. Setzler. This time, every session, I have to admonish Mr. Setzler about a, about the brevity of a question. So, if we could keep it brief, just in light of the other witnesses that we have, in all seriousness, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, again, I do appreciate, it. gentlemen. I, I would agree with uh, the author that um, resources should not be our primary concern. I, I don't make resource arguments. I think there's no function of the state government that's more important than law enforcement. And if it's, and if this were the policy of the committee, then I think the resources are secondary. I think it's, it's what we do here. I would say though, you know, certainly, I, I don't know that if you would um, support every decision the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals brings out, 
um, nor do I think you would suggest that just because 24 states do something, Georgia ought to follow suit. Now, there are 29 states who believe that Obamacare and the health care mandates constitutional have not become part of the lawsuit. I, I, I wouldn't agree that those 29 states are right. Those are 29 states that, I, again, I, I, so I don't think that other states are doing it is persuasive that Georgia ought to. I, Mr. Chairman, with that, I, I would go to the heart of my question, which is um, you talked about the many matches that are, that are found in other states that are taken upon arrest. Do you know what percentage in general in Georgia or statewide of felonies that are charged, um, that are brought, uh, or actually bring convictions, or, or, or wh whether they're no lows or convictions? I, I don't have that information in front of me, no, sir. Would you disagree that it's a vast percentage, 85, 90, 95 percent? I, I, I would tend to agree with that, yes. So that if this General Assembly um, acted to take DNA upon felony conviction, that 95 percent of all felony arrests would it's at, upon conviction yield the same sample you're seeking to take upon arrest. Isn't that true? It, it is true, and I would simply point out, and there are a number of documented cases where, as, as you're well aware, I'm sure the committee is well aware of the criminal justice process and it is not always as speedy as we might like it to be, and that uh, many times there are individuals who are arrested many, many times before they are convicted. They commit many, many additional crimes. In the city of Chicago, information that I provided earlier, which again pointed out that there were 60 violent crimes that would have been prevented had they earlier, Illinois now, now has it, but had they earlier gone to uh, DNA testing upon felony arrest. So you're, you're certainly correct in that eventually upon conviction and upon incarceration we would, we would have those DNA uh, samples available. I would submit to you that we are leaving a, a door wide open for a lot of violent crime to occur in between, and I don't, I don't see any public policy justification for that. And, and Mr. Chairman, just to, so to draw the conclusion, so that with respect to unsolved crimes, you know, the, the, the subset of, of people for whom taking DNA upon arrest that would not be taken ultimately upon conviction is a very, very one in 20 perhaps. And that to the extent the issue of, of releasing people back on the streets is the case, it's really only those cases in which a, f a felony is going to lead to a subsequent acquittal and that DNA was not taken in the due course of, of the investigation, in which case many times it is taken because it's relevant to the direct investigation, I think you would agree. And also to the extent that folks are um, going to be released to the streets um, and DNA was not taken. It's only to that extent um, so, so I, again, I would just, just ask the author to consider the since 95 percent, 90 percent are going to lead to subsequent convictions, that DNA is going to be taken and is going to be able to, to solve unsolved crimes. Uh, I, I would just sub submit that the, 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 the relevance of even what you're suggesting, really the, the, the universe is narrowed down um, to a very, to really the subset of cases that are going to lead to an ultimate acquittal. And to, again, when you balance that against the, the, the the privacy concerns, what I believe to be a constitutional concern. I think the, the, the value of what this bill promises is frankly overstated when you consider the fact that if we take DNA upon conviction, we're going to get that DNA in 95% of the cases. And, and my only response to that would be, again, going back to the City of Chicago Police Department study that cataloged 60 violent crimes, and of those, 53 were people that were raped or murdered, and they would, they, they would have been prevented had the DNA been taken from these eight individuals for their first felony arrest. And, you know, I agree we have to balance, uh, you know, a lot of different considerations in this debate. But I think if, if it was going to prevent 53 rapes and murders in the, in the entire state, uh, I would certainly support it and support it uh, strongly. So, Mr. Coomer, and then we'll go to our other witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator McCoon, thank you for bringing this bill. I, I wanted to ask you specifically about the Chicago um, study that you've cited now, I think, four times. Uh, you said the Chicago Police Department identified 60 violent crimes that could have been prevented by collecting DNA evidence on first arrests uh, for felony arrestees. Is that correct? That's correct. Now, I understand that the collection would identify perpetrators after the fact. I, I understand how that would work. What I don't understand is how, how collecting DNA samples on an initial arrest 
would prevent crimes from happening in the future. In particular, if you're talking about somebody who gets arrested for, you know, in Georgia, it's a it's a felony to have a second uh, occurrence of illegal dumping. So if you collect DNA on a person who's who's committed that offense in particular, how does that prevent a murder or a rape or another violent crime in the future? These these individuals um, were serial offenders. They committed many crimes, that, and they had committed crimes before their first felony arrest. And so had they had their DNA taken at the first felony arrest, it would have been matched to the previous offense. They would have been... Uh, hopefully convicted on that basis, but since that did not occur, there were 21 additional felony arrests going forward after the first felony, uh, which accounted uh, for a number of the uh, the crimes that I referred to in the study. Right, but the point is, that, and if I may, Mr. Chairman, just follow. The point is, collecting the DNA evidence on the first arrest would have made it easier to identify them after future crimes were committed. But it would not. I mean, we're not we're not keeping everybody in jail because they're arrested for an initial felony. We're keeping their DNA evidence so we can identify their association with future crimes. It's not preventing future crimes. It's just making it easier to identify previously arrested perpetrators. Isn't that correct? I, I mean, I I guess what I'm my my difference of opinion with you on this is once someone is linked to a violent criminal offense and they are convicted and incarcerated, they are obviously not free to walk the streets and commit additional crimes. And in these cases, had the DNA been taken upon the first felony arrest, uh, I, I guess you can't say to a certainty, but one would certainly argue that they would have been subject to criminal prosecution and incarceration for those prior crimes so that they would not have been free to walk the streets and commit additional criminal offenses. Thanks, sir. Senator, thank you. Thank you. Let me call uh, Jack Martin with the Georgia Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. Mr. Martin, you know the drill. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the committee, I'm Jack Martin with the Georgia Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. Um, let me just point out a few things, and I'll tell you what we support. Uh, we support uh, LC 294802S, which is the uh, House Bill 299, which passed out of this committee, as the appropriate uh, DNA bill that should pass out this year. There's some problems with SB 80, and it's the reverse that it also troubles me. SB 80 doesn't have any of the protections that HB 299 had, with regards to preserving samples for exoneration purposes down the road and doesn't have the, the protections regarding um, the, uh, uh, a, the right of someone convicted, convicted of any felony to request DNA testing. I've had experience with that in a recent case in which a murder death penalty case in Columbus in which we were able to get DNA samples. And I, I will confirm what Dr. Heron said. In that case, it was a very notorious case it took us a, almost a year to get the results. So you're talking about a very complicated procedure, time-consuming procedure, and there's already a backlog in the crime lab. Uh, it, if we go to taking DNA samples from every arrested person, that's even going to make that backlog even greater for pending cases. And it turned out in that case that the DNA sample of, from a, a rape victim was not the, the, the defendant's uh, sample. That wouldn't, we wouldn't have been able to do that but for the chance that I found those DNA slides in the Columbus Police Department property room, even though the district attorney, in good faith, and the GBI had said for years that those samples had been destroyed. Per chance, just going through that file, we found out, as uh, uh, the GBI uh, just said, Mr. Bankhead just said, the procedure was to return these samples to the uh, investigating agency. and. They actually had it in a box full of other items that related to the case, which we found per chance. And that DNA exoneration would have never occurred but for that fact. So SB 80 is, doesn't have the, re, the reverse side 
of protections that we need, which is to preserve evidence regarding exoneration evidence. Uh, regarding the um, profile, and I, and I understand uh, uh, Representative Abdul Salam is not here, but her concern about destroying the sample, the sample destruction is not really the key because they'll get a profile, and the profile will be in the computer, which is a DNA profile. Um, now, as I understand, Dr. Heron, and maybe that will be destroyed too, but as I understand, SB 80 doesn't say anything about destroying the profile. What happens when you take a DNA sample, and a DNA sample is uh, a, a computer printout of the what they call alleles, up and down, whether you have certain alleles which are genetic markers, that profile will be maintained. As SB 80 is currently written, you only going to destroy the sample, and you're not destroying the profile, which is the key thing. Uh, so there's a, a deficiency in the bill in that respect with regards to destruction of what the real evidence is, which is the profile. With regards to um, LC 294806S, which is HB 299 along with HB 402, which is the uh, uh, expungement bill, uh, we supported the expungement bill. We think it's a good bill. Uh, however, I will say just candidly to you that we would believe it's probably wiser for this committee to pass out HB 299 along, which is the 4802S, because the expungement bill has um, uh, complications with regards to it might, might doom the bill from being passed. We think it's important enough to get 299 passed, which is everybody's on board. The GBI is on board with that. The prosecutors, the defense lawyers are on board with that. It covers both sides of the coin, that which SB 80 doesn't cover. It covers qu other questions, which SB 80 doesn't cover. It is something that we know that the GBI crime lab can do now. There won't be a funding issue. Uh, this can, we believe this is the best uh, vehicle to go forward with. Though we love HB 402 and wish it could be passed, uh, quite frankly, we're not asking the committee to do that. We would just prefer you go ahead and pass out LC 294802S, that SUP, with just HB 299, which has been vetted by this committee in great detail. Uh, that's all I have to say. Uh, if anybody's any questions, I'd be happy to answer. I see no questions. Good. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Sarah Tatanchi with uh, the Southern Center for Human Rights. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, I'll be very brief because most of my comments have been covered uh, thoroughly by committee members and by Mr. Martin. Um, we would also support the passage of the substitute containing just uh, Chairman Neal's bill. Um, we really believe that this committee has done its due diligence looking at the issue of DNA this year. And um, House Bill 299 strikes a balance of where we need to go this year in this state. And it's the place where we actually can have the resources to carry through with this mission. The GBI has stated numerous times that they do have the funding to provide for this. And it's an appropriate tool. Um, if we're going to be going after trying to solve these crimes, trying to prevent future crimes by taking people's DNA, it's appropriate to use more of a fly swatter to go after these flies as opposed to Senate Bill 80, which is more of a sledgehammer going after flies. Um, we definitely echo the committee's concerns about things like the overbreadth of uh, the application of Senate Bill 80, as well as privacy concerns related to taking genetic material from people who haven't been convicted of any crimes. Um, and finally, uh, the onus of having the DNA sample expunged being on a person who is ultimately found to be innocent. Um, that's a that's a huge burden, and we know that there's already so many challenges for people trying to expunge arrests, much less um, actually having material removed from a state database like like their own DNA sample. So, we would encourage the committee to uh, follow through with uh, their support of Chairman Neal's bill, and uh, that that's the appropriate way we need to go this year. Thank you. I see no questions. Mary, Mary Ellen Fulkus with Keep Georgia Safe. Hi, I'm Mary Ellen Fulkus. I'm Executive Director of Keep Georgia Safe. I'm here to support um, Senate Bill 80, um, Senator McCoon's version, um, taking felony uh, DNA 
upon felony arrest. Um, I believe waiting um, until conviction is not enough. It leaves too many loopholes. Um, Georgia is the only state right now in the southeast that does not collect DNA upon arrest. Um, as Senator McCoon um, said, the 24 other states that are doing this are seeing great results. Uh, I believe, and so do a lot of uh, Keep Georgia Safe supporters, that this is a public safety issue. Um, preventing murders, violent crimes, rapes, keeping children safe from um, rape, violence, crime, sexual predators, keeping adults safe. Uh, my nonprofit, uh, we focus on safety education and crime prevention training in Georgia. We've been around almost three years. We have supporters across the state. When we conduct our safety seminars and our trainings, uh, send out our e-newsletters, uh, everyone is in full support of this that I talk to, and they can't believe, they just already assume that the state is doing everything they can. DNA is the fingerprint of the 21st century. Um, it should be collected at time of booking when mug shots and fingerprints are taken. Uh, the fingerprint alone sometimes is not enough. Um, all the points have to be um, taken, and um, this is what's going to help keep our society safe. If you watch the news, you pick up a paper, even if you're a parent or not, you're just a citizen living in Atlanta or the surrounding areas of Georgia, anywhere. Crime is a big problem in the state. The city of Atlanta, it's a big problem. This is going to help protect the citizens. This is what the voters actually want. They want a safer city in Atlanta. They want a safer state in Georgia. Um, if we're going to help protect people, we need to pass this. Um, when it comes to profiling, or there's concerns about, you know, if there's any racial profiling, uh, I really would wish Senator McCoon would hold up what a DNA code looks like. 17 numbers, a sequence of numbers. Um, it's non-biased. It's non-invasive. It's a quick cotton swab of the mouth at the time of a felony arrest. Uh, a mugshot is is more biased picture than anything. This is not. Um, and the other fact. Um, is it has set a lot of people free for wrongful convictions, and it actually saves taxpayer money in the long run. Um, I know budgeting is a concern. Um, I think that as legislators, you all need to figure out a way to make this work so GBA de GBI does not have a backlog. It's ridiculous that a state can't, you know, should have a backlog of DNA of something so important that's going to help, you know, speed justice and help keep our citizens safe. Uh, when we fund things like state golf courses and other things. This should be a priority in our state. Uh, too many children are victims of crime. Uh, there's too much violence in our state. We need to please do more. And I, I'm speaking from a lot of Keep Georgia Safe supporters. And um, so I please hope you consider the importance of keeping children safe. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Sethlin. Just I had a friendly question for you. Sure. And, and I appreciate your being here. I really, really add, appreciate your coming to the Capitol. It's not what you're paid to do. Um, Kind of, kind of a philosophical question for you. Um, do you think there would be value in taking DNA upon birth? Um, Actually, every, every DNA is taken at the hospitals upon birth. Do, do you think there would be value? Parents have to sign, and it is taken. And, and I'm not going to get tested. It's just, 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 just a simple question. Wouldn't there be law enforcement value to taking DNA upon birth for every child and putting it in a database so that if they – Subsequently commit a crime? No, it's not a law enforcement value, but it actually helps um, uh, test for, um, you know, diseases and things like that, and it is taken at the hospital. But if it were, and again, I'm mm -hmm. not, I'm, I'm not going to get tested with it. I just, just wanted to ask philosophically. There, I mean, th there's the law enforcement value in having a DNA code for every citizen. Is there I not? Don't, no, I don't think so. Are you an attorney? I'm not. No. Oh, just checking. I'm not. I, I just I just asked that because the, the, the arguments can be made that there's great law enforcement value of taking it from every child and the entire population being in the database. <laughs> and there'd be crimes that, that wouldn't be solved by, by SB 80 that could be solved through that. But the, the question is, what's the appropriate intrusion? I just Yeah, I don't think that has anything to do with a DNA felony arrestee law. I think that's more of a big government scare tactic. But this is something completely different. We're talking about people that are committing felonies. Um, actually, the federal government, if you commit a, um, a f uh, felony and you're arrested by the feds, your DNA is automatically taken. And that's been going on for years as well. So I think that's a completely different picture. And uh, like your scenario with the, the, the nice little league coach that's swatting people with baseball bats, I think that's really far-fetched to what we're talking about right here. And 
I hope that person would never coach my children. Uh, and if he is stealing cocaine, then, you know, he's got a lot of other things to worry about. But when you're talking about protecting the citizens of the state and your voters, this is working and it's proven and proven in New Mexico, it's proven in the Chicago studies. And you look at the crime that's going on, the murders and the rapes, um, the serial people, the serial offenders, we're talking about a way to catch them and keep the citizens safer. You all really please look at this and take it seriously. And I don't think that the big government, you know, and, and oh, everyone's going to have your DNA. Don't let that scare you. It's a quick cotton swab of the mouth. It's the same as it's the fingerprint of the 21st century. A mug shot is actually more identifying than a DNA or a fingerprint, I believe. And that's a, a, a way to profile someone more from their picture than from their DNA. But thank I, you I appreciate the, the work that you're doing, but please understand this. We do take this seriously. No, I want you and to take it seriously. And reasonable minds do differ on these issues, and there yes. are, it's a little more complex than I sometimes complex. it gets described. So and I understand that it's one very person's complex perspective. the safety of our state and the prevention yeah. of more murders and rapes and yeah. getting the people that are violent. I'm talking about preventing violent um, offenders that are constantly in and out of the system, they're arrested, and then once they are arrested on a felony, it's taking two to three years for them to finally get conviction. Those are the people that we need to take care of in a legislative body. I do want you to take this extremely seriously, and I hope that you will do the right thing and take a good look and pass Senate Bill 80, Senator McCoon's bill, like the other and states I say in again, we are taking this issue very seriously, and no one should think that we are not. Okay, I hope so. We all have the same goal. It's not quite as sim simple or simplistic as some would make it out to be, however. Ms. Abdul Salam. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and, and I want to thank you for your advocacy uh, as a rape survivor in which nobody was arrested or convicted. I'm very sorry for Because that. I was profiled. I was profiled. So it does happen. I understand. Um, but you keep saying the the DNA should be taken at the time of arrest. In yes. this country, we've always Bell. been taught that. Felony arrest. Ma'am, I'm going to ask you. You're, you're, I'm going to ask you to let a member of the House actually complete their statement before you actually interrupt them. Yes, sir. Thank you. In this country, we're always taught that you're innocent until you're proven guilty. Mm -hmm. But it seems as though you have the assumption that you're guilty once you're arrested. And I think that that's, that's not the right thing that you mean to say. Um, so why would they take the DNA at the time of the arrest? Uh, no, ma'am, I don't believe you're uh, guilty at the time of arrest. Taking someone's DNA is just a tool, the same, I feel it's the same category as fingerprints and mugshots. It is not. It's not a conviction. It, it is not the same category. We just differ of opinion. That's how okay. I feel it's the same. It's a tool. It's Thank an identification you. tool. Ms. Neal. Thank you. Um, just for clarification, because I'm not necessarily familiar with the process, but um, when you stated something, there were some people in, in the room that shook their head uh, saying that the fact wasn't correct. If if the thing is about the federal government, if, if you could speak to what... So correcting is at conviction at the federal level. Is that correct? Okay. Thank you. I was Mr. Ra um, Mr. Ramsey. I, I, I just want to echo some of the chairman's comments. And, and I, I say this as somebody that does not believe there is a constitutional infirmity by taking DNA at arrest. I support, I've supported legislation of that nature in the past. But I, I do take great offense, even to people that disagree with, with, with me on that point of this committee, the suggestion that those people don't take seriously public safety. And I would advise you in the future when, when testifying before this committee that, that you temper your comments a little bit and, and suggesting that, that anybody in this room doesn't take public safety seriously really hurts your cause. And, and I say that as somebody that supports the expansion of the use of DNA and the collection of the DNA. So I offer that only as, only as friendly advice. Okay, well, I'll retract that. Um, maybe I said it incorrectly. I was just wanting you to everyone please take it very seriously. I don't. Um, you have to understand, you all do this maybe every day. I'm out fundraising. I'm out putting on safety seminars. I'm a former educator. I'm a novice at this, so please forgive me then. We appreciate your coming down this morning, and we appreciate your dedication to the issue. Re beyond all else, your intent 
is our intent. It's just not quite as uh, what I would say to you is we appreciate your being here. We appreciate the work that you're doing. We're trying to get to the same place that you are. That's about all I can say on it at this point. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Susan Cash. First of all, I just would like to say that it is an honor to be here today, and um, I speak from my heart. If it makes anyone uncomfortable, I apologize. No, please do. Okay. Um, I was uh, 19 years of age on uh, July 1st, 1985, when I was abducted by a complete stranger from a payphone, taken to an abandoned house, raped repeatedly sodomized repeatedly, beaten and left for dead under this house, um, was shot in the stomach, bullet went through my liver and my colon, lodged a quarter of an inch at the base of my spine. Um, nearly 26 years later, I still have physical issues because of what was done to me. Um, contracted two ST STDs from this man. One was surgically removed the other I will live with the rest of my life. So the physical trauma of what was done to me um, has been very challenging. The emotional trauma of what was done to me and what I survived has been enormous. And I look at July 1st, 1985 as the night my life was taken from me. It took me 14 years thousands and tens of thousands of dollars, 14 years of constant therapy, three months in a mental hospital, a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder and treatment for that, for me to find recovery and healing. Um, some years ago, I came to a place of forgiveness for my assailant, um, but forgiveness and accountability are two very different things. And uh, almost 26 years later, I sit before you with uh, my heart's desire of still wishing to know who this monster was, who this man was that changed my life in just the blink of an eye. Um, and I want him to be held accountable. Uh, six years ago, because of the job I now do as a director of a rape crisis center and a victim advocate, um, I discovered that my name was in the GBI database, which meant the night of my assault, um, they had done a rape kit on me. I was in such bad shape, uh, I did not know that. Savannah Police with all due respect, <laughs> botched the case from the beginning. And so for the last six years, I have been advocating for myself to find resolution to the identity of my assailant in the hopes of having justice. And um, there are some things going on right now in regards to my case. It is still open. It was open five years ago. And um, there are some things, hopefully, um, coming about. I'm not excited about them, but I am hopeful. Um, as a person who deeply cares for all victims of crime, not just rape victims and survivors, I will always support anything that's going to be good in... Um, promoting DNA um, and helping prevent any kind of destruction of evidence in DNA. And I thank you guys so much for listening. I know y'all have been in this room for quite some time, and um, bless you. Thank you for having the courage to come down and, and share your story with us. That's not easy. I can't imagine. I just, you know, you it's try a, to, but you can't. It's and a I'd blessing. It was also the way I look at it now. It's not just the day I lost my life. It's the day my life began. And um, I've been able to turn that around. Good for you. 
I'm not sure the number of people would be that strong. Yeah, you never know what you have to do. And and with that, I just want to say there is no one in this room immune of being a victim. No one. So, so true. Thank you very much. Bless you. Ms. Rebecca, is it Delbart? Delhart, I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just Thank you, Mr. with uh, the Georgia and network to to uh, fund end sexual to uh, end sexual assault. I didn't write very clearly. I apologize, Mr. No, Chairman sorry. and Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you so much for having me here this morning. And I'll be very brief because I think most points have already been covered. I just want to thank you all so much for your work on these bills, and um, we really appreciate it. And we appreciate being a part of the team and working with the Berries, and um, with both Chairman Neal and with and with. Um, Senator McCoon, the Georgia Network to End Sexual Assault fully supports Senate Bill 80, and um, we represent about 20 centers throughout the state of Georgia. Um, those centers work with victims of sexual assault, both um, through counseling, through court advocacy, and general victim advocacy. And I'm just pleased to answer any questions if you should have them. I see no questions. Thank, Thank you. you for your support. All right. Um, I fail to recognize Judge Stevens. Is he still back there? Oh, he escaped. He escaped while he could. I understand. We'll recognize him if and when he has the uh, the courage to return. <laughs> um, that ends the, the public testimony portion. Um, uh, members, we have, and I appreciate um, all of the witnesses and, and their comments, and certainly the author um, for bringing the bill to us. We have. Um, several alternatives in front of us. Um, let me go ahead and ask what is the pleasure of the committee? Mr. Ramsey. It's just a procedural question. Is sure. it, I want to make a motion do pass of one of the substitutes, mm -hmm. but procedurally do I need to move on the author's bill and offer that in the form of an amendment after that, or can I make a, a motion do pass on the my, my preferred substitute. You can make a motion of do pass on a preferred committee substitute. Okay. Well, I, I move do pass uh, 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 SB 80, uh, the, the committee substitute, which is LC 294806S. I, I do that not because I have any constitutional or privacy concerns with Senator McCoon's very well thought out legislation. I do it purely out of the staunch belief that the GBI is ready to implement this expansion of DNA collection in the felony conviction context. We have the ability to make Georgia's citizens safer almost immediately by doing that. I will continue to have signed representative packs and will continue to sign D, uh, bills aimed at expanding the collection of DNA because I believe it does make Georgia's citizens safer. But we also have to do what we can do based on fiscal realities. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, I, I move, again, do pass SB 80 uh, in the form of the substitute LC 294806, which also contains the record restriction bill that we work very hard on, uh, which I think is an important uh, important advancement in Georgia, in Georgia law as well. All right. There's a uh, move, due <coughs> move due pass by Mr. Ramsey of Senate Bill 80 by substitute LC 294806S, as in Sam, second by Mr. Setzler. This is the substitute to make sure the committee is clear. That uh, includes both uh, uh, Chairman Neal's uh, uh, House Bill 299 as well as the House uh, Bill of 402. If I'm making sure I've got my substitutes correct, Ms. Travis, that, is that right? That uh, this committee uh, passed out um, a week or two back. Uh, are, are there any amendments, first of all, Ms. Neal? Just based on the recommendation by the GBI, if we could change the portion and in reference to Ms. Uh, what Ms. Salam referenced, let the GBI dispose of the samples the, the typical way they would that would not incur any more cost. Uh, I guess there will be a line change on 34. Well, we're actually operating from uh, the substitute of 4806S, not from the underlying bill, from the committee substitute that you should have in your file. Now, another question. Okay. Um, listening to the testimonies and when the reference was made, especially by Mr. Jack, Martin mm -hmm. about passing 4802 instead of 4806 for fear of so we won't lose either bill if we can kind of have a discussion on because I, I would hate I guess we have to look at what we, we want to risk losing because something is attached to it 
and and you know that is ultimately something that I I'm not going to try to influence one way or the other. I will tell you that if we were to move 4806S, which includes both Representative Hatfield's expungement bill and Chairman Neal's uh, DNA analysis bill 299, should that go forward out of this committee and go to the Rules Committee, and should it be ascertained at that time that there are structural problems with the 402 portion of the substitute, it's my very clear sense that if there's a feeling um, uh, both in the House as well as in the other body that that would be problematic for um, for uh, the substitute, that it would be recommitted back to this committee um, for cleanup, and we do have time to do that. So if it should be a poison pill, which I guess is what we're really talking about, if the 402 portion should end up being a poison pill for SB 80, then my sense of it is it would be, it would be recommitted um, and uh, and changed accordingly in order for the underlying bill to go forward. Okay. Ms. Uh, Ms. Abdul Salam. Mr. Chairman, I'm actually um, diligently trying to find the section in um, the substitute that deals with the disposal uh, and the destruction of all samples because that is a problem in the bill. What the GBI has said before this committee, they do not destroy all samples. Uh, and if that is contained in this substitute, we need to fix that. Chairman Neal is here. Chairman Neal, are you able to address that in the context of the substitute? Where would we find it? In 4806S? I'm, I'm listening. Okay. Or if, or if the GBI wants to, to weigh in on that within the substitute. The 299, just to make sure it's clear, the 299 portion in both substitutes is identical. There's no changes in the 299 language in either one of the substitutes, but we're on 4806S. Not the same. 248. Sure. Just uh, pull the microphone if you would, it's Ms. Not Travis. not the same language. You can pull that one. The, the, lang the language in Senator McCoon's bill is new language, and this, the language in Representative Neal's bill is existing law. On page 8 at line 2, round 258, that's existing law. And so the the what might be characterized as a problem with Senator McCoon's bill is not in Chairman Neal's bill. Okay. Mr. Sessler. And the reason it's new is because that is if House Bill 24 passes the, the evidence code, the so all of it would be new. It would be repealing the evidence code, the and that's why it's right. Thank you. Okay. Any further discussion on the gentleman's motion of do pass of Senate Bill 80 LC 294806S as in Sam? Are there any amendments? Seeing none, all in favor of the gentleman's motion signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The ayes have and the motion is adopted. Thank you all. We'll um, move to. We should probably take a real three minutes and contact Senator Carter. Uh, we will take Senate Bill 93 first. We'll take, uh, let's take five minutes, a real five minutes. We'll convene back at, uh, at 1130 promptly. All right, let's continue uh, this meeting of the House Judiciary Non-Civil Committee. We have two more bills left on the agenda. We have Senate Bill 93 and Senate Bill 36. I've spoken with Senator Chairman Carter, and what we're going to do is take 93 now. We do have a function that uh, members are going to be attending with the state bar that we've had planned for a while. However, and a notice will be sent out immediately, is that we will have another meeting Monday morning, Monday morning from 9 until 10.30 uh, Monday morning. Um, in which we will go ahead and address and take a motion on Senate Bill 36. So I just want to, you know, give members who are here a heads up about that. We'll certainly send an email notice out immediately. But we, uh, given the time, and 36 is not something that you can rush, would want to rush, we want to give it some time. Um, and so we'll do that on Monday morning at uh, 9 a.m. promptly. So with that, let me go ahead and ask Chairman Carter to come forward, if he would, and uh, present Senate Bill 93.
And again, let me remind members um, of the the bar function um, at noon. Directions are being um, passed out to you right now. If you can make it, that'd be great. Thanks. And Chairman Carter, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I bring before you today Senate Bill 93. This is our annual drug update bill. As you know, every year the Board of Pharmacy has, our Georgia Drugs and Narcotics, has to take existing and new drugs and put them in certain schedules. Keep in mind now that there are five different schedules. Drugs are, are categorized in, in certain schedules depending on their, their potential for abuse as well as their potential for addiction. Schedule one drugs are drugs that have no medicinal use. Schedule two are the ones that are most addictive and then we go down to three, four, and five as they gradually decrease in their addictive potential. This is a yearly drug, as I said, an annual update. One thing that you might be familiar with, for instance, is um, Allegra is now going into an OTC status, and so we need to get that corrected. I, that just happened a couple of weeks ago. What is different for this bill this year than what normally happens is that we are taking pseudoephedrine, which is one of the main ingredients that's used to make methamphetamine. We are taking that and making it an exempt Schedule 5 drug. Now, let me explain to you that when I say exempt Schedule 5 drug, that means that you will not, you will not have to have a prescription to buy pseudoephedrine. You can still buy Allegra D. You can still buy Claritin D. But you will only be able to buy it in a pharmacy. You will not have to have a prescription. We have been specific in here that we, we have actually added in the code that it is an exempt Schedule 5. There are Schedule 5, other Schedule 5 drugs that are exempt that the Board of Pharmacy promulgates that and decides which ones are going to be. But this w it was so important that we made certain that we put in the code that this one would be exempt. We, not that we don't trust the Board of Pharmacy, but we just felt like it was very important that we codify it and put it in the code that it is an exempt Schedule 5 drug. One other thing that I will mention to you that is different this year that, that, than most years is that we have taken the bath salts that we are having so much of a problem with that are being abused, and we have taken those and put them in the Schedule 1 drugs, which means that they don't have any medicinal use. These are drugs that we're having a lot of problems with now. They're being abused. They're being sold in head shops and everywhere else, and and for no other reason but to be abused, and we've taken those and made them Schedule One drugs so that we can get them out of those shops and get them off the streets. There is, um, Mr. Chairman, one amendment that I have that I have offered, that is AM thirty three ten seventy eight. This simply has to do with the pseudoephedrine. When you take a drug and put it into Schedule Five, wholesalers, the, that is the the drug wholesalers. That, that kicks into to effect a, progr pro a progress that, a proposal where they have, to, they have to have certain storage requirements. We don't want them to have to have those requirements, so we've exempted them for this particular drug from those requir requirements, and that's what this amendment does here. And that's it, Mr. Chairman. I'll be glad to answer any questions. Let me just uh, make sure everybody uh, members have the amend the proposed amendments AM thirty three one zero seven eight AM thirty three one zero seven eight and let me just uh, take a moment for members to uh, digest that since it's uh, being distributed for the first time. Uh, Ms. Abrams, do you have a question? Uh, Senator Carter, um, Section nine, um, can you speak to what? Fexafenidine is and what it's used for? That is the Allegra that I mentioned that, earlier. That's Allegra? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> Senator, is there a, um, a representative of the State Board of Pharmacy here? We have the um, executive director of Georgia Drugs and Narcotics who is here, Rick Allen. Okay, Mr. Allen, it w oh, I'm sorry, right in front of me. Uh, I want to get uh, your statement on the record regarding the, um, regarding the proposed amendment. Okay, this amendment just codifies that 
There are go no additional requirements for the storage of the pseudoephedrine. We know, realize that would be uh, too bulky, and we wanted to ensure the wholesalers that they wouldn't have to build new cages and go to any different procedures than they're doing now. DEA uh, quite effectively controls pseudoephedrine as a chemical, and we're just saying we're going to follow their guidelines and their rules. Okay, so this is consistent with... Yes, or sir. not inconsistent with um, any federal uh, parameters on no. on the handling of such a substance. In fact, the rule for uh, wholesalers states that they have to follow DEA guidelines if it's not in the rule. Okay. This is all. This is we're just putting this in the code to uh, make it clear. Okay. Any questions from Mr. Allen from members of the committee? Okay. Seeing none. Thank you. Thank you. Is anyone else like to be heard on Senate Bill ninety three? Seeing none, what's the pleasure of the committee? Let's do it by do pass, um, Ms. Travis. I said we'll just go ahead and do pass by substitute. Right. Um, I'll, offer the, I'll offer the amendment. Uh, well, let's just take the motion. Mr. Sessler, you want to go ahead and move do pass? I'm going to right. I don't want to make the wrong motion here. I want to make sure I've got the substitute in front of me. But, uh, well, we're going to go ahead and make, take a motion on the underlying bill. Move to pass. All right. Mr. Setzler moves due pass of Senate Bill 93. It's LC 36173-1873-S as in Sam, second by Ms. Ms. Abrams. Are there any amendments? We'll go ahead and offer um, on behalf of the author Amendment 331078 that members have in front of you. Is there any objection to the amendment? Is there any objection? Seeing none, the amendment is adopted. Are there any further amendments? So just by sub or? By sub. Yeah. Um, seeing none, all in favor of the gentleman's motion of do pass by substitute of Senate Bill 93. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. The ayes have and the motion is adopted. Again, we will send out the notice for 9 a.m. Monday morning for consideration of Senate Bill 36. Thank you for your time and patience this morning, and we'll see you Monday. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Thank you, Senator.